um, has to do, we think, with what causes FDS, with, which is mutations in people's blood cells. And all of us are, unfortunately, accumulating Arr. mutations in our blood cells as we get older. And so every time our cells divide, we randomly get It's a steady increase that you can detect in those living cells over age. But most people never develop FDS or any else. So it's, it's kind of an unusual phenomenon, but I think that's what contributes to this age. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, our marrow increases in cellularity with age as well. It does. Is that any very long? Do you think? I think it does. I think that as we get older, um, all of us are, like I said, accumulating mutations. Many of those mutations mean nothing. Because remember, you have 3 billion letters in our DNA, and you're randomly getting a mutation in one of those. And most of the time, it means nothing. But if you have a cell that has a mutation that could cause those blood cells to sort of take over, as we age, our normal bone marrow does go down in sort of diversity and uh, cellularity. That could allow these mutant cells to come up. So I think it's a combination. It's a good observation. This was a slide I showed downstairs, but we're really going to focus on, on MDS. And it's important that there's a group of, of patients that have what we call low cells in the bone marrow uh, that overlap between aplastic anemia and MDS. And these people are important to identify because they could respond to therapies that are used to treat aplastic anemia, which are giving immune suppression therapies, different than typical chemotherapy. So there's a subgroup of these people, but the majority of people with MDS do not fit in this category. And these are the things that we're going to talk about that you look at when you're trying to diagnose MDS. You're going to have to look with a, a, a CBC, your blood counts. And that's usually why people get into to the clinic to get evaluated. This is because one of these blood counts is low. And then we look into the bone marrow to really make the diagnosis of MDS. And this is what people present with. The one that is... Um, often really difficult is fatigue, right? So these symptoms uh, are related to the three blood cell counts. So we have three major blood cell types. Platelets, those help you clot. So if you get cut and uh, you have low platelets, it's going to be hard to, to stop, or bruising. So when you have low platelets, that's what people, they might have, gosh, I've been bruising for the past four or five months, and I just I don't understand why low white blood cells, this is what fights infection. So people might get lots of pneumonias or bronchitis or urine infections. And um, the reason is because of blood, white cells are down. And then this is the one that's the most common. Almost everybody experiences low red cells, but it's the most vague of symptoms. You, it's really just fatigue. You just, I just can't do what I used to do. But people, oh, I'm getting older, and I haven't been exercising, and so you know, they sort of uh, chalk it up to something else. But this is what people uh, will, will come in with. How, so how do you diagnose it? So I'm going to have a little key up here. We're going to march through just these little things. And it'll tell you where we are. So this is part of the diagnosis workup. So if somebody has those symptoms, then you come in uh, with the low blood counts. And the decision is always, if the blood counts are, are low enough, and all those things I was saying about stairs, your vitamins, your thyroid, are, are normal. Well, what do we do next? If you have usually two of the three blood cells that are low, then you're going to usually get a bone marrow biopsy. If you just have one blood cell, either the red cells, the white cells, or the platelets that are low, there may be additional tests to try and figure it out. But if you have two or three of those blood cells that are low, you're usually going to get a bone marrow biopsy. And so um, it's the only way you have to have a bone marrow biopsy to diagnose MDS. There is no other test that you can have that is going to say this is a bona fide MDS. There are things that are closely related, but the biopsy is critical. So how is it done? Um, if 
you or a family member uh, has probably had this done. So this is a person laying on their stomach, and um, this is the hip bone in the back, the pelvis here. So you don't feel it on yourself. You have two little bumps on the side, spine running down the middle. That bump that you feel is what we're shooting for to try and get into the marrow. It's this little peak right here. That's the pelvis bone. And what is done is a needle is put into that bone. So lidocaine will numb up the surface and the surface of the bone. The needle then is a blown up. You will go through uh, this fat tissue in the skin and then into the bone. Inside the bone is like this meshwork. You have a thick capsule. And that's where, you, you know, when they push to do the bone marrow, you get, where you get through the capsule. And then in the sponge area is all the bone marrow cells. That's where everything is made uh, for the blood system. And there's little holes in the end of the needle. So once that goes in, then they hook a syringe up and you pull back on the liquid. You cannot get this from the, from the blood. And the cells that live there are not in the blood. Um, and so unfortunately, we haven't figured out a better way of, of doing this. Um, if that, you get the liquid part, but you also get a piece of the bone. And they take that bone, and it's like a, if you had a ballpoint pen, it's about the size of the end of your pen. They'll take it, and it'll be about a centimeter long, and they'll take the calcium out of it. And so that makes it very soft. And then they cut it with a knife, really thin pieces, and put it on a microscope slide. And that can tell you what the bone marrow looks like, the liquid part and that bone part. And that's what they use to diagnose MDS. The third thing that's done is they have to look at the chromosomes. So the reason we look at chromosomes goes back decades. This was the first way we could look at genetics. The first way we could see are those cells mutated. We now have much more sophisticated ways, but this has been around for so long that we know what it means when you get a result back from here because we've been able to follow people for decades. We're now starting to supplement, and I think at some point we'll even replace these studies with sequencing um, studies. So these are the three things that you need to diagnose MDS. Any questions about that? Dr. Welder, we have a question that was submitted. Um, patient wants to know, are this, is, is it in, two questions. One is, during the cytogenics, is that when they determine what, the muta what mutations might be present? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, where does the FISH test fall into this? Yeah, so the cytogenetics will give you, um, at the chromosome level, I'll show you a picture of that. Great. It's, it's very um, low resolution. It tells you very big changes that are in those cells. You can then look by a special technique called FISH. So again, I hate to use acronyms, but it's fluorescent in situ hybridization, F-I-S-H. There you're looking for very specific changes at the chromosome level that you know are important in MDS. Okay, so this is a panel because we've studied patients for decades. You say, do you have this or don't you have this? Sometimes you can miss it by looking at the chromosome studies. Um, so that's how those two fit in, and they're very important for uh, the prognosis part that we'll get to. So this is why we have to do the bone marrow biopsy. So this is a, a map of normal blood cell development. So what we're used to looking at is what's in our blood. You get a blood draw, they put it in the machine, and you get these results back. We're look, we look at white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells. And these cells all circulate around in the, in the in the blood. And we have different types of white cells. We have <coughs> lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophil, basophils, and neutrophils. These are all subtypes that fight infection in different parts uh, of that. Okay, so you cannot diagnose MDS from here. You can get the suspicion of it. You can look under the microscope and say the cells don't quite look normal. But this is what you're looking at. It's these cells back here. So our blood system is unbelievable. You can, and this has been shown experimentally, you can identify a cell, you can isolate it using techniques in the laboratory. And this, you can take one cell called a stem cell, and it can repopulate an entire organism body. Okay, this has been done in mice, where you take one cell, you completely wipe out the blood system of another mouse, and you put that one cell in, 
and that mouse will recover its entire blood system. Unbelievable, right? Every one of these pieces. So we do that in humans. That's the fundamental uh, uh, underpinning of a bone marrow transplant, but we don't just put one cell in. But we're essentially replacing one person's blood system with another by putting in stem cells. So this system, and the reason it's important for MDS, is the mutations that are happening are occurring way up in the cell that gives rise to all these other cells. And so you have mutations that are then affecting all these cells down here, and they're not working normal. So this, though, is sort of where I want to highlight. This blast, myeloblast, and they actually misspelled it, they're missing an L in there, is the cell that is important in the workup of MDS and AML. And you'll often hear about that with the doctors. What's my blast count? It is this cell that, the, the, under the microscope, the pathologist is trying to identify and count. And the reason is, is going from here to a mature cell is where things get screwed up in MDS and leukemia. And if you have too many of these, it means you have too few of these. And so what you're really trying to enumerate, and after decades of having thousands of patients, we, have, we now know that the blast count is important and is predictive of, of certain things. So the blast count is what it is, and the only way we can get this is from the bone marrow. Okay? So that's mm -hmm. the main thing. So let's look at what the pathologist sees from here to here. If you take this myeloblast to a neutrophil, those cells, they move along. And this is what they look like under the microscope. This is a cartoon drawing, but this is essentially what the, the pathologist looks for. This is a nucleus of a cell. This is the outer part, this blue part, is called the cytoplasm. These cells, as they mature and grow, they're going to change. This cell can become this cell. It's got a lot of granules. It can become this. What you'll notice is that the, nu the nucleus is starting to change from here to here, it's starting to become oblong, it's starting to get pushed in like a kidney bean here, and then it starts to form these little nodules. This is very well defined, and you can look under the microscope and you can see, see this happening. And in people with MPS and AML, it is not right. It is completely abnormal. And so that's one of the hallmarks of MPS. This is normal. So this is actually what it looks like. This is cartoon, but these are people's normal cells. These are normal. So this neutrophil, this, this cell looks like this, right? This cell looks like this. So these are the normal chirp cells that we see in our blood, and these help fight infection. This is the bone marrow of that person. What you see is you see some of these earlier cells that look like this. You never see these in the blood. Don't see them. So this is what a normal bone marrow and normal blood looks like. And the pathologist is just trained to identify that, right? There's no other marker, it's just his eyes, they've seen it a hundred times. So here's what MBS looks like. So MBS, if you look at the bone marrow, has these unusual cells. So see these, they just have one nucleus. Look at this one. It's got two. So you got it. That's not normal. Okay. See this little guy? He's got like a dumbbell looking thing. They should be nice and round like this. This has, and that's dysplasia. So these are the features when you say myelodysplastic syndrome. The dysplasia is this. That's where the name and the disease is called from. And look at this guy. He's got what? I don't know, seven of these little blebs? You shouldn't have more than four. If you have five or more, it's abnormal. And then this guy, is, is he's supposed to look like this. What he's missing is all these granules, all these little dots in there. Those dots help fight infection. They get released when an infection is seen. So this is dysplasia, and, and you cannot uh, know that without looking at the bone marrow. And the difference between that and leukemia has to do with these blasts. So the pathologist will look at a microscope slide, and you should have 4% of the cells. They'll simply go around and count 200 cells. And if you have more than 8 out of 200 cells that are blasts, that's abnormal. All, everybody should have 4% less. But now look here. This is the bone marrow of the AML patient. I mean, what, what do you immediately notice about this compared to this? 
So, yeah, you haven't developed. You, you, you don't have any of these later stages. You, you're just blocked. It's like, boom, this guy just copies himself. And you have no uh, further development of the blood cells. So what happens is that person cannot fight infection. They end up getting uh, pneumonias or getting sick from that. And what I'm also not showing you is remember the stem cell these are sort of an equivalent. You then start to get anemia because you're you're not making red cells. You get low platelets, um, and these cells can stay, take over the bone marrow. Okay, so that's how you're going to diagnose it. This is just a picture of the core biopsy. This is the bone piece that, that comes out of there. So the other stuff is the liquid part. So this is hugely blown up. This would be the size of the tip of your pen, right? And it's like a long shaft that gets taken out and it's about a centimeter long and it's blown up so this is the bone it said it was like a sponge so this in between the sponge is where all the blood cells live so this would be the hard part of the sponge which is actually bone and this is bone marrow in there and what do you think these little blobs are so the bone marrow is the pink stuff i mean it's white stuff Myeloblast? No. Oh. It's, yeah, that's fat. I'm fat. <laughs> okay, so, all of us normally have fat in there. And it's interesting, this is where people will talk about the cellularity of your bone marrow. You can't do it from the liquid part because there's no reference point. It's just, it's just put on a slide. But this is cellular, so you have to have the bone to compare it to. A normal cellularity is based on age. And um, when you're 80 years old, the amount of blood cells you should have normally is different than if you're 20. And the number is usually 100 minus your age. So an 80-year-old would have 100 minus 80, 20% of the marrow would be cellular. This is about 60%. You see some of them are a little more dense than other areas, but on average, the pathologist will look and say, your cellularity is 60%. And if you're 40 years old, that would be normal, right? 100 minus 40. So sometimes in MBS you can have low cellularity, and sometimes, most of the time, you have too many cells, high cellularity. In AML, you almost always have too many. Cells are just packed in there because they're just growing. All right, so that's what the core looks like. So now you guys are pathologists, right? You, you've, seen what, <laughs> you've seen what they see. Here's the, the other part that's really tricky, and this is cytogenetics, and we talked about this. So inside each cell is the nucleus, and in the nucleus you have the chromosomes, and you inherit a set of chromosomes from mom and dad, right? And so you're going to have two chromosomes of each number here, from 1 to 22 plus the sex chromosomes. So you're going to have 46 total. And what they do, each of these, one's from mom, one's from dad, these are chromosomes stained with a stain. So they take the cell, and it's very uh, simple. They, they take it and they break the nucleus open, and they cause the cell to grow a little, and they just drop that on a slide. It's, it's crazy simple. And then they stain that, and you can actually see this under the microscope using the chromosome. And there's a, somebody who's seen these and knows the pattern they can actually tell the difference between chromosome 8 and chromosome 9 based on when they look under the microscope at these little bands. So what is, was seen in this patient is look at the second chromosome 5. It's short. So they've actually deleted one whole part of their chromosome. And these are in their MBS cells. And it's in every cell in their blood system. And we know now, based on these chromosomes, some of these things are not good and some are okay. And this goes back decades, right? So this is in our current, we use this technology in our current scheme. And you, you're probably right to say, wow, that seems pretty, it's interesting, but it's also kind of low level because, you know, this is a huge piece of DNA that's missing that has a lot of important things in it. So what's the important thing that I'm missing that's causing my disease? And then the research, that's what we're trying to figure out. All right, so cytogenetics. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, on the uh, chromosome that you said is missing. 
Okay, so a normal person would have, um, let's see if I get this out right. You would see that with a diagnosis of MDS. Mm -hmm. That's correct. What if you had a bone marrow biopsy prior to your diagnosis mm -hmm. of MDS? Um, would that show up? I mean, does it suddenly appear? appear Perfect, yeah. We, it, it gets to the fundamental question of, I, I came in today to clinic and I got diagnosed with MDS. I didn't just get MDS today. Mm -hmm. How long has it been there, right? Right. And at what stage could you have seen sort of even the precursors of this? Mm -hmm. And um, we don't know the answer of the timing. I'll share a little bit of research in the field about how we think this evolves and how we're trying to address that question. Because there is a point in time when you could have taken cells and you probably could have found this before they had full blown disease. And if you had been able, it's probably jumping the gun, if you had been able to do that, there is still no prevention. That is, that is right. And that's what we're really okay. interested in finding. Because if you could find that early enough, could you do something to prevent it mm -hmm. or to suppress it or to control it and live with it? That's exactly where some of the research is going. Yeah. And to do it at a, at a more um, uh, a high resolution way instead of just chromosomes. We had a patient who identified this and said, is that Del Q5? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a common. Facebook common, fans, you're right. <laughs> yeah, that's a common thing in MDS. So, okay, if we take all that information now, you have to, then with MDS, you have six different possibilities of diagnosing this. And it's really, it's based on what they see under the microscope, what they see with the blast count, and what they see with the genetics. And so MBS for all of these, and then they have different abbreviations. Single lineage dysplasia, that means of the three blood cell types, white cells, red cells, and the platelets, do you have one, two, or three of those that have those funny shapes to them? If you have one, and it doesn't matter which one, you call, you're called single lineage, okay? So that's SLD. If you have two or more, then it's MLD, multi-lineage, just means two of, two of the three. And then this one is called ring blast. It's really different looking. The pathologist will look at this and they do a special stain with iron. And they, they're looking for iron accumulating in the blood cells in an abnormal pattern. This should not happen. So this is a nucleus, and this is iron that's been stained and is around the nucleus here. So they call it a ring. And sideroblast is just a type of cell. It's a very special type of diagnosis in MDS because it's associated with a very specific gene mutation. And so that's important um, to know if you have that. The next one is really based on whether you have that chromosome change that I showed you. If you have this chromosome change and nothing else, and an, an, an anemia, you fit into this 5Q minus syndrome. It's usually associated with women and different changes in their platelets as well. Uh, but it's very specific. All of these have normal blast counts, which is kind of unusual. That means 4% or less. So compared to a normal person, they don't have an elevation of blast, but they just that their cells don't look normal. So that's how they get the MDS. And then these two categories are have excess blast, EB. And you can have from five to nine or ten to nineteen percent blast. And that's just the pathologist sitting there counting. They count two hundred cells and they give you a number. The reason this is important is because once you hit twenty percent then you have leukemia. That is the defining line in the sand between MDS and leukemia. Does the, and it may, it may be like, not make sense to you, like, why? You're telling me if I have 19%, I have MDS, and if I have 20, I now have AML. Well, it's, that's how the system is right now, and it largely is bored out because for clinical trials and treatments, to be able to compare across institutions, you had to have some rules. If I'm treating a patient in St. Louis or in Boston, how do I know we're using a drug and getting the same outcomes if I'm 
calling this person MDS and this person AML. What we now know, and what you guys probably can imagine, is that line is very arbitrary. And at the genetic level, it's very arbitrary. But right now, that's what distinguishes uh, MDS from AML. And you can have MDS with two different flavors, you know, low and high, and then go to AML. And then this is sort of the grab bag. It's unclassified. MDS, we don't know. It's something MDS. Okay. So here's, you know, I always spend a few minutes about this. So MDS is a cancer. Um, years ago, people used to call it all sites, kinds of names, and, but the bottom line is it's a cancer. Everything we know about the genetics of it and how it behaves, um, it's a cancer. And so cancers are really diseases of our genomes. And by that I mean they're driven by mutations in our DNA. Sometimes, rarely, these could be things that people are born with that then move on. But that's most of what we're dealing with. Is these are things you weren't born with, you acquire as you're aging. And they can be random mutations. They can be mutations that are caused by other chemotherapy or radiation that, that somebody has gotten for other treatments. There can be environmental exposures that can cause changes in the DNA. But what we see here in the cell, you have the nucleus and these chromosomes, and then you have the cytoplasm, right? So inside the nucleus, these chromosomes are made up of wound together DNA. If you continue to unwind them, you get down to this little strand of DNA, and you have these pairing of these called nucleotides. You know, you have A, T, G, C. There's four of them, and those com combined three billion letters long make up our genome. It's not random because there's certain sequences and patches in that long three billion uh, strands that code what's called genes. And there's a, maybe 20,000 of them in our genome, and that's what makes up our body, right? So that those genes get made into proteins and make up what our cells are. The problem that happens in MDS and leukemia are twofold. One is you can just whack out a huge part of the chromosome, like I just showed in a chromosome 5. So it's not something that you're born with, you just lose it and it's gone in your cells. So when you lose it, you're losing thousands of genes. And if those genes are important for blood cell development, which they are, then you're going to get disease. The next thing is you can mutate these genes. So if I blow this up, See this little C here? If I get a single mutation, this is amazing, single mutation in the genes, this C is changed to a T, that can completely change how a gene and a protein works. And if you get multiple of these single changes, yeah, that can cause disease, MDS and leukemia. So it's, uh, it's remarkable. Now what we're in the business of doing is going from looking at deletions of chromosomes to now trying to sequence and identify the genes that are mutated in your MDS and AML because that's, we know exactly that what's causing it. Okay, and this is what, when I was talking downstairs with the Genome Institute, where they have the ability now to just sequence every base in a person's cancer. We now use this clinically to, to look at 50 or 100 genes that we know are important in the disease. So when you come in, everybody gets sequencing done to understand what are the genetic mutations. Because for treatments, we now have a few treatments that are directed at specific genes. So when you say you have MDS or AML, it's important. The next question is, well, what mutations do you have? Because there are drugs or clinical trials that are indicated for specific gene mutations. So cytogenetics are pretty good. We, um, we only find them in about half the people. So half, the other half the people, when you look under the microscope, they look normal. If you were to look at the genes and sequencing of the entire 3 billion bases, 100% of people have mutations. But again, at this resolution, you only pick up about half the people. And the biggest one is this chromosome 5. So you want to know this because if you have 5 q syndrome, it's very specific and, and treatments would be uh, directed towards that. 
So these are common gene mutations, as I said. There's probably 30 genes that are really commonly mutated across people out of these 20,000. Um, and they are broken down into different categories. What's important now is there's a gene set of genes called splicing genes that control how we stitch together and make proteins, how we stitch together our RNA. About half the people will have one of these mutations. So that's a lot. So one out of two people with MDS. And the reason it's important is there could be treatments that would be more effective in this group of people. There's another half of people that have mutations in a set of genes that regulate how we make our cells as well. Now we're going to spend a few minutes talking about this gene here, P53, also called TP53. It's the most commonly mutated gene in cancer, not just MDS, AML. Only 5 to 10% of people with MDS or AML, but, but if, if you have it, it, it's a very high risk. It um, can be really challenging to treat and cure uh, and get rid of What's the mortality on MT53? Um, in the so, general population? I mean, in the yeah, patient that transform and go to transplant, what's the mortality? Yeah, so in MDS, we have uh, several large studies. If you, if you go to transplant, with that, there's still, uh, you could be cured, but it's a low, about a 20% chance at five years. So, a lot of effort is being placed into treating that. And Dr. Walter, um, we have a patient who wanted to know, do you need to go to a special genetic doctor to determine what the mutations are, or is this, will this all of this be shown during your bone marrow biopsy? Yeah, so it's now available through a standard clinical testing at many okay. laboratories. And the, the way those, each clinical lab will offer slightly different genes that they sequence. Most of the common ones are common to all of those. Okay. And this can be done on the bone marrow, mm -hmm. um, but it actually now can also be done on the blood. Okay. And it's, you get very similar results between doing it from the bone marrow and blood. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so. It's important to have this done. We have not fully incorporated this into um, the prognosis of, of MDS, but it will be very soon. There's a, there's a, that'll be the next thing. So that is diagnosis. So all of that is done during the diagnostic period. So the question then is, uh, what do we do with that information? Right? It's important to know what disease you have, and then, well, what does that mean? How is it going to affect me? And so that would be prognosis. So this is looks complicated, right? It's the revised international prognostic scoring system. So we abbreviate it by I P uh, S S R for the R at the end. So you'll hear that term I P S S or I P S S R. We we like to use the revised system. It uses these variables. It looks at your cytogenetics. It looks at your blast percent, and then it looks at your three blood cells. Okay, so that's what you need. And then through a different set of scoring systems based on thousands of patients that were untreated for MDS, so it's sort of a natural history study where you said this was done before we really had any treatments. And they, they looked at these variables and they said, okay, this set of variables, these people did better than these people. You take those, you get a score for each of these things, and then you add up your score, and then you have a total score that puts you into one of these five categories. So these risk groups are based on two things. How long am I going to live? It's called overall survival or OS. And again, for an individual patient, this is really hard because I'll show you, it doesn't mean your that number is for you. It gives you a sort of a general reference point. And then the second thing that is really closely tied to survival is how risk am I of getting leukemia? Because that's a game changer if you tip over into leukemia. Okay, so those are the things that you get from here. Generally, these are less aggressive MDS, and these are very aggressive. And then you have a group in here who's sort of gray zone called intermediate. So how does this actually work? So let's just look. Here's a, a, a hypothetical. 75-year-old man who has MDS with multi-lineage dysplasia. So he got that diagnosis right from a pathology, but now we want to know what's his prognosis. And he has a hemoglobin of 80. 
So that gets, he gets one point for that. Platelets of 45. He gets another point for that, so he's got two points so far. Neutrophils of 0.6. Neutrophils are the subset that fight infection in the white cells. So it's less than here, so 2.5, right? Last of four, so 3.5, he gets another point there. Cytogenetics are normal. So it's weird. Normal cytogenetics aren't actually the best thing you can have. Uh, you'd think that that would give you the lowest points, right? But there's this crazy key down here with all these things, and you just plug it in, normal, it turns out here. So he ends up with 4.5 points, and you come down here and you go, oh. so he is, actually, it, it falls down in this uh, region here. So he is in this high-risk group. And so then you can take that and say, well, what does that, what does that mean for me? And this is the overall survival that I was talking about on this IPSSR. So you have the very low, low, intermediate, high. Rate. So here, this curve, if you take the 50%, the average sort of survival in time, and you take it down here, it can be under two years without treatment. Okay? And you can see that if you were in a very high risk, it would be worse. And then at the very low risk, you'd be out here at nine or ten years, right? Dr. Wilder, we've got a question. They just wanted to confirm that the IPSS score is obtained prior to treatment. So this is yes. during the diagnosis phase. So if so, someone hasn't already had any treatment, so they if, if they're in the middle of it, they shouldn't use this. That is a very good point. So it's a, a diagnosis it's called de novo, untreated. You walk in the door, this is what you have. Once you've started treatment and things change, then that is not designed for that, and there are other tools. So this, remember, you don't know. Um, you could very well be a person out here that lives 10 years with this disease, right? This just means sort of the average person. And this is overall survival without any treatment? Yes. Okay. And, um, and so it's always challenging. We use this information to help talk about the disease and what we should do and what to expect. But um, we don't have a great predictor for where an individual is going to fall on that. So it's just a sort of a discussion point uh, to get started. So if people um, are dying of MDS at different time points, you can remember that the average age is you know, 70 years old. So if people could live for eight or nine years with this disease, and, and that might be the sort of average lifespan of a person in the United States, so 78 or 79. So we don't know that they're, they, not necessarily they're dying of, of MDS. This is just you died of something. So if you look at, let's say, 100 theoretical people that had MDS and, and you track uh, what's the percent, what, what would they die from, it's going to be of different things. There's a large group of people here that die of unrelated causes. They call it geriatric conditions, right? All these people down here get 100 people, 29 of them would just die of, of sort of natural causes. There are the people that could die related to their blood counts, bleeding, mm -hmm from low platelets, infection, anemia-related things that could cause heart disease or, or, or cardiovascular. Uh, and then there's people that go on to get AML. Some could be saved with a transplant, but other people will die at some point during that. So um, there's a lot of contributing factors, and essentially we're trying to prevent the preventable things with transfusions, antibiotics that we can and trying to then move more people into transplant that we can to cure this. Okay, any questions? What's the difference in survival uh, if you go to transplant with MDS as opposed to AML? Yeah, so it uh, depends on a, a lot of factors which are how responsive your disease was going into it. In AML, there's so many different types of AML that it is, um, I think that's a good a tough question to answer without specifics on sort of the genetic background. But in MDS, you get an unrelated transplant, sort of all comers, that uh, you could have a, a, a 
about a 40% chance of carrying that disease at five years, right? So lots of variables go into that, and people will fall on different parts of that curve. In AML, you can get similar, uh, similar results, but there's so many different genetic types. Yeah. Um, so this is the, how we use this low risk and high risk. We say, if you have low risk, these are these bottom two categories versus high risk, the upper two, and then you have the intermediate group. You've got to think about what, what the goals are. Here, we want to decrease the number of transfusions, improve symptoms, improve quality of life, right? On high-risk disease, if you don't do something, things are going to progress, and uh, you're going to have worse outcome. You're going to have lower survival. So we want to change that. These people could live long enough with the disease, right, that could die of other causes. So uh, the the risk benefit for, of, of treatment and transplant in this group has to be very carefully considered. This group that's higher risk disease, you want to intervene. You want to delay the natural progression. You do not want them to transform the leukemia. And you want to improve their survival. Okay, so those are fundamental differences when you have the disease. You want to know my high risk or low risk. There are six treatments that we currently have that really fall into these two categories. If you have high-risk disease and are eligible for a transplant, you want to get the transplant. That is going to be your only chance to cure this. And that is going to be a decision you have to make with your medical team because there are some serious side effects of going through a transplant. HMA, cyclomethylamine, tidase, and bacogen, um, are indicated here and for some of the sort of intermediate risk people. And then on this low risk side, observation, hormone supplements to try and boost your red blood cell counts, and then uh, lenalidomide is another drug that's used over here. And then if you have this hypoplastic FDS, this immune suppression. So I want to go through just some key aspects of that. This is a complicated flow chart, but if you break it down, it's not. You really follow these arrows and you get to these six treatment options that we just talked about. So let's just focus on treatment now for a low-risk person that's observation or hormonal therapy. The way you get there is that you, you don't have symptoms, but you have low blood counts. Then we say, keep going. Let's watch your blood counts continue a healthy lifestyle, and we'll follow you regularly and watch your blood counts and your symptoms. And if something changes, then we'll readdress whether we need to do treatment. And the reason is, as I showed you, those people could live for more than a decade with this disease and not need anything. So the second one here is if you have an anemia in this Del 5, you come down here. But if you, if you have anemia, but you don't have Del-5, you come over here and you look at this hormone erythropoietin, and you'd say, well, if I have a low hormone level, which is needed to boost my blood cells, then maybe I'd benefit from getting a hormone shot. And those people would go on and get a, one of these two forms of hormone shots. And you could have anywhere from 40 to 60% chance of that working for you and not having to get blood transfusion. Okay, so those are sort of the least invasive approaches. The next group would be, again, low risk. You have symptoms, you have a low blood counts, and you have this deletion we talked about. That's why you want to know it. You can get this drug on the line. You can also get that drug if you don't qualify for EVO, and I'll show you why we consider that for some people. It's based on these two studies. So lenalidomide called Revlimid was studied in two different groups of people. People that had this deletion on their chromosome and people that didn't. And the reason these people needed treatment was because they were getting blood cell transfusions. If you used this drug, 68% of the people got off of blood transfusions. They did it in a fairly short time, a little more than a month, and they had a pretty big rise in the blood level called the hemoglobin. This is not, doesn't last forever, but it can be quite effective for these people. 
And then they tried it in people that didn't have it because they said, well, maybe this is a, such a good drug, let's try it. And it actually worked in you know, about a quarter of the people. And so still hard to predict who this is going to work in. Here, we know you can do it for that chromosome change. What are the side effects of Revlimid? Um, so you can have... Uh, uh, significant ones. What's that? Or the significant ones. Yeah, the people do well. It's GI side effects then tends to be the biggest one that people complain about. Okay. Yeah. And the, the other one, which I'll talk about a lot of these drugs, is cytopenias. Mm -hmm. So not only it's used to help your blood counts, it can suppress some of them. Yeah. And that can get people on and off the drug um, when they're using it. Mm -hmm. If the platelets count is affected, which can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a big side effect of this. So the other therapy, we've talked about these three, is you can get down to this called immunosuppressive therapy. And people, it says, well, what are the favorable characteristics of these? Who would respond? Usually we think it's people that have hypocellular. This is where you look at the age and the, you know, what your cellularity is. Low blast count, and people that are under 60. And these are things like, uh, more than steroids to suppress your immune system. It's not treatment that is trivial, but it is treatment that people can respond to and often requires initially being in the hospital to get some of these drugs. Okay? And then there's a the high risk disease. Again, Peter's going to talk about transplants and if you are eligible, that's still uh, the best option and the only cure. And the second thing is hypomethylating agents. So these are the two drugs that we've had. The last drugs that have been approved for MDS in 2006. So 12, more than 12 years ago now. And what you can see for Vidaza or Dacogen, this, if you get treated here with what was called best supportive care, that means transfusions, antibiotics, versus if you got the drug in one of these two forms, you essentially moved from an 11 month average survival here to 18 months. So it actually improved the length of time. Now, in different types of patients, now these numbers uh, are better. This was 2002. And a lot of things have changed since then, largely supportive care with antibiotics, transfusions. And so this is what got approval for the drug, though, is we were able to have people live longer. The similar findings with Dacogen, where 7.8 months up to 12 months. There was differences in these trials, uh, but this ultimately led to the approval of Dacogen. And now Dacogen or Vidaza are both indicated. The thing to remember is it takes time for these to work three to four cycles before you might see a response in most people, and it can be up to six cycles. So we recommend that people get at least six cycles of Vidaza before you give up, and at least four cycles of the cytidine. So during those first few cycles, it's hard. You can have low blood counts. The, the drugs are intended to improve your blood counts, but there's a competition between your normal cells and the MDS cells. During the first cycle or two, if your MDS cells are high and your normal cells are low, you're waiting for those to switch over. And there's a time when everybody's low. How so long is the cycle? It's a month. So this is usually given over a seven day period, and this is over five days. Thank These you. are currently given either as shots under the skin or in the IV form, although there are new pill forms that are being tested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the side effects here, again, blood counts, and nausea, uh, fatigue, and because the blood counts are loaded to get risk of infection. And then Peter's going to talk about uh, bone marrow transplant. Uh, doctor, going back to the last slide, mm -hmm. uh, it could take up to three months to start working, could be three to six months. Mm -hmm. Once it starts working, how do you determine that it's working? Yeah, so you look at the, at the blood counts. It's usually the thing that is driving somebody going on to this. And so to have a complete response, you become transfusion independent. Your blood counts remain in a normal range above those cutoff levels. 
and the blast count has gone below this 5%. But the first thing we'll see is that the blood counts improve. And when you say the blood counts, is it all three? It's the white, it's the red, and it's the platelets? That's right. Sometimes people can have one of the be disproportionate. You can have improvement in one or two over another one. But the best response and complete is all three of them get better. Do you have a certain interval you do bone marrow biopsies if somebody's stable? Yeah, if somebody has been stable, um, so if somebody has completely improved, you just can watch the blood counts. If somebody is uh, on treatment and the counts are stable but have not returned to normal, then there would be an indication to do um, bone marrow biopsies because you could see improvement in the blast count or the genetics when you look under the microscope. And so when you do that is fairly variable. There's no standard, but it's usually you know, at this time point when you're trying to make decisions uh, going on. Do you ever have patients, you know, they are on it for six months or a year on the Videsa, and they're stable and they say, I want to break for a couple months? Yes. Do you currently, let them? It's really challenging, right? Uh -huh. So currently, um, is, I think I said here, so indefinitely, yeah. there is really no good evidence, and people are very concerned that if you come off and then go on, that it's actually harder and can be more resistant to treatment. But it's an area of investigation um, that we just we don't have enough data. So currently, we recommend staying on. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. What what did you say happens to the blood transfusion um, intervals during the treatment with hypomethylating agents? Usually during the first one or two cycles, people get transfusions. Okay. Um, and then the goal is that that would lessen as your normal blood cells um, mm -hmm. recover and you're responding to the treatment. But usually during the first cycle or two, you're still, um, both. You're still getting transfusions. Okay. And sometimes it can get worse during that first cycle because you're suppressing everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll spend uh, five minutes on, on some new treatments. There's, there's things that are coming that are, are very encouraging here. And this is a cell, and this is the nucleus. And this is a T cell um, here, an immune cell that could uh, fight and, and have an effect on the MDS cell. Okay? So each of these uh, areas here, these are different treatments that are being tested. Okay? And those can be things that are being used that affect the DNA in the cell. They could try and enhance this immune system, so you're trying to use your own body's immune system to kill the MDS. And there's different signaling pathways here. So I'm going to talk about three different um, approaches here. One, uh, so let me just go, I'll, I'll go through them, but I want to highlight what they're doing. This, the neoclax, this is a mitochondria, it's the energy sort of part of the, of the cell. I want to share with you that. I want to share a drug that is attacking this P53 that we were talking about, and then a couple of other ones, but really highlight um, at the end is Patercept. This is the drug that's probably going to be approved in the next few months, and the first drug since 2006 for MBS. Okay, so MBS, remember you have the low, the intermediate group, and the high group. These are risk groups. And we already talked about that treatment is really going to be different between that low and high group. I want to uh, tell you about three studies in this intermediate and high risk patients, and then the low and intermediate uh, group with loose powder stuff. So there's other drugs that we're not going to talk about, and I'm happy to, to address at the end. So clinical trials, briefly, they go through three phases. So the first phase is you just have to test if uh, a drug is safe. It's been tested in animals before it's tested in people, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to have problems. So phase one testing is just looking at see okay? The second phase is then to say, okay, it's safe and we have a dose. Now let's use that dose to see in this disease of MDS is uh, <coughs> efficacy. Is it doing something? And then if it's doing something, then they would go to a randomized, a blinded study where you're really testing it compared to something else. 
or against a placebo. Dr. Walter, yeah. do you mind answering one quick question? Mm -hmm. um, what happens if you get no response and are still transfusion dependent or the dependency increases along with other systems increases um, during uh, treatment? And I think I believe they're referring to like Vidaza or Dacogen. Yeah, so if, you, um, so if you don't get a response, and again, we recommend that you get um, at least you know, up to six cycles. If you progress in that time and things get worse, then that is an indication not to continue. If things are getting worse, so there's a difference between things being stable and you would continue on. But if things are getting worse, and then that would be an indication for a repeat and bone marrow biopsy and reevaluation of these measures that we talked about with diagnosis, then that would be, and then come back that they're worse than when you started, then you would want to switch treatments. So um, I think that's the decision point if, if things are, are worsening. Thank you so much, Doctor. We appreciate that. And hope hope you got that on. I'm typing it up too for those at home. <laughs> so this Venetoclax is uh, a new drug that has been approved in AML. And so there's a lot of drugs that are moving through the pipeline for MDS that are first being tested in AML and then moving over to MDS because I told you these are very similar genetically. There's some there's there are distinctions but a lot of similarities. And um, Venetoclax is one of them. It's been approved specifically in older people who can't get the strong chemotherapy for AML. A phase three study is ongoing. So it was actually approved based on earlier phase studies. So this is now being tested in MDS <coughs> patients that are higher risk. So this is using the old IPSS and R, but they're this sort of intermediate and high risk group. And you basically take these pills for 14 days out of the month. In combination with the Vidaza that you get by IV or injection, okay, and that's just given seven days. And so um, this trial is recurring patients here and is recurring patients nationally. And the encouraging data from the AML is that we're very you know, excited about this. And it may actually work in patients with these P53 mutations too. The second group is trying to get at 50% of the patients in MDS, they have a mutation in one of these genes that regulate how our RNA is stitched together to ultimately make proteins. These mutations in these genes, these are the four most common ones, um, seem to make cells susceptible to different treatments. So there's a, a trial that I don't have listed here that was listed on the other uh, slide that uh, was being conducted called h 3 b 8800. It is specifically for these patients. And then we have a trial here that is at Wash U in Boston that's using a drug specifically, again, for people with these mutations. And um, this is basically a, just a daily pill that you take continuously. And, and that study is open at Harvard and is open here in the next month. Okay, so this is now we're moving into genetics driving the treatment um, of where we are. And for folks watching at home, all of the MDS as well as aplastic anemia and PNH trials are on the AAMDS website. We go through the entire clinicaltrials.gov, so you don't have to. Um, and we, we highlight them specifically, so you can short, sort through a shorter list. Um, and we highlight those that are currently recruiting patients and then the, any restricted restrictions. Um, and we also have um, information on clinical trials on our website, and you can always call us. Lee's really good at helping people find the right trial. <laughs> now, the last group is this P53 mutation. So this was a drug called APR246. It was combined with Vidaza, not, it's not on its own. And in 20 patients, this is what we know so far. So 15 of the 20 had MDS, 5 had AML. The response rate and the complete response rate of 67% in these people. So this is a notoriously really difficult to treat set of cancers in patients with P53 mutations. Compared to what we would expect of maybe 20 to 30 percent response rate, this is really good. So this is now in phase three. So it's already jumped to this uh, third phase, and we are enrolling patients here nationally. These, if you have a mutation and you haven't yet gotten treated, um, this would be a great, uh, a great thing to, to try. And then 
This is uh, really important because it's going to be FDA approved based on phase three study. Have your step. So this is for patients, very specific. Remember I showed you that picture of the ring sitter glass had this blue yeah. circle around the nucleus? It's a set of patients of, that MBS is very specific that have ring sitter glass. They tried the hormone treatment um, or they were ineligible, they couldn't tolerate it, and then they got on to this drug. And so this is Patercept, is a shot on the skin every 21 days. People experience fatigue and bone pain from that. But what changed was the transfusion ease. So these are people that are getting transfusions. You got the placebo, 13% of people didn't require transfusion over an eight week period. Okay, for various reasons, they just, they, they got better. But three times the rate, so 38% of people got off of transfusions. If you got off of transfusions, and you look a year later, about 40% of the people that had success with it were still having success with it. Okay, so this could uh, be really successful for a group of people. Most of these people actually had a mutation in one of these splicing genes, so it's probably going to be a good indicator if you have this mutation that um, that drug's going to be very effective. This gets back to this original question, it's the last slide I have, about I, why did I get this? How long have I had it? And we often don't know, other than if you've had a specific exposure to something that we know puts you at increased risk of MPS. We're not really sure why you got it. We think it's an age-related thing and accumulation of mutations. And then how long did you have it? Again, uh, we don't have great things because we never just randomly sample the population and then see who later develops MDX. So if you have a normal person, we now know that there are people that by the age of 70, 10% of the population has mutations in their blood that people with MDX have. Exact same mutations. And they have normal blood counts, right? So this is really a shock and a surprise. So it starts to get at this question that, that, you, that you had originally. Those people, a fraction of them can develop low blood count. So they have the same mutation, now they get a low blood count. And then what changes when you become MBS is when you get the dysplasia, right? So we think people probably march along this pathway. And if you can catch them at different time points, then maybe you to understand those transitions and you could perturb it and delay it or prevent it. And then eventually uh, some people get leukemia. These are the best estimates we have on how frequent people move down this pathway. You have mutations, it's still relatively rare, but a huge increase over the general risk of getting MDS angle. About 1% of the people per year could get uh, a uh, MDS or leukemia or another blood cancer. If you start to get low blood counts, have a mutation, but don't have dysplasia, so you, you don't technically have MDS, if you live 10 years, chances are you're going to get MDS or leukemia. 95% of people over a 10 year period. So this is a super high risk group of people. They're now being called clonal cytopenias of undetermined significance, CCUS. And those are people that we are um, actively trying to study and, and treat and help through this process and to ask to donate samples so that we could try and figure this out over time. And so we're really focusing on, on this transition of, of these people to MDS specifically to see if we can delay, prevent, or come up with um, different approaches. And, and that is fundamentally what's underlying this new initiative that's been supported here by the uh, Edmund T. Evans Foundation. So it's a center for MBS, but we're really interested in understanding why these people with cytopenias that don't yet have dysplasia or MBS have it. So we're doing um, uh, several things. We're engaging those patients with oncologists, myself, cardiologists, because it turns out that they're at higher risk of having heart disease. And so we need to optimize their heart health with exercise, diet, and medical intervention if needed. And then 
uh, many of these people are older, and that can have influences uh, on just their activities of daily living and their general health. And so we have a geriatrician involved. So we're going to see those patients. We're also pushing for new treatments in MDS, including immunotherapy, and, and trying to explore ways to give transplants without chemotherapy. That's a big barrier for why most people with MDS can't get a transplant, which is the chance to be cured. And um, we, as I said, we want to understand this, and we're asking people to participate and um, if they feel if to donate samples that we can understand the, the genetics behind all this. Blood so, or bone marrow? What's that? Blood or bone marrow samples? Blood. Mm -hmm. And you can contact me by email um, you know, if, if you have questions, and we can talk you know, questions now and, and afterwards at the break, too. I'd like to say something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I represent a disease that was diagnosed in pediatrics, but 50% um, of the patients have PG53 to start with. Uh, it's Schwachmann Diamond Syndrome. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with the name, I'm sure. Um, and I, you know, I'm sitting here and watching you talk about people over 70, and I'm seeing it in two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are conditions in which children can be affected by MDS and AML, obviously. Um, and we've often said that the bone marrow of Rockman Diamond patients is that of a 70-year-old. And that's exactly why um, it's very interesting. I notice a lot of research. Do you know Coleman Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's helping us out. So mm -hmm. we're sort of like very much in the MDS, right? <laughs> you know. It's good. I'm glad you're engaged. Yeah. Dr. Walter, I have a yeah. couple of questions. Uh, uh -huh. One, on that last slide, you showed uh, uh, the mutations lead into MDS and then leukemia. Yeah. Can you go directly from the mutations to leukemia, or is it a progressive that's MDS and then it could progress? Is that how it works? Yeah, so, um, there, so some of these mutations, patients will come in just with leukemia, the blast count, and the defining thing is the blast count uh, there. And so we often don't know what somebody transitioned in before they showed up because they came and the last count was greater than twenty percent. But there is a transition period. They're not going just from zero to to AML. And um, transitioning to restate the, the question again. Well, I, I you answered it. Uh, I was just curious if uh, if MDS leads into uh, leukemia. But like you said, when somebody comes in with leukemia, that uh, you don't know what they had before, if they had MDS. So yeah. that, that answers that. And the second question I had is... Let me, I, I do want to clarify, because the defining thing, again, comes down to this dysplasia. It's defined by the uh, pathologist looking under the microscope and seeing these abnormal cells. Because you can have AML that comes out of MDS and AML that doesn't. Yeah. And both people are going to go from a normal blast count up to about 20%. It's just whether you have this dysplasia or not. And that can be super tricky to figure out. And we think that there are some mutations that probably say you had MDS even if you didn't see the dysplasia and you show up with AML. So there's a little bit of nuance in there. So, yeah. My second question was, uh, I, you hadn't mentioned anything about any skin disorders or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, are they associated with MDS? Yeah. Yeah, so a common thing in both MDS and um, leukemia, and I should say common, but it occurs uh, is infiltration of the skin with leukemia or MDS cells. And that's something called sweet syndrome. And it's seen, we see it, um, we see it here at, at our center uh, every year. So it's, and it's essentially the, those malignant cells that are, they get into the skin. And with treatments, they, they get better. Yeah. At what point do you differentiate myelodysplastic syndrome with myelofibrosis? Mm -hmm. So there's, on that original circles, there's a um, uh, circle called MPN, myeloproliferia plasms, and those diseases uh, are often associated with myelofibrosis, and we do see overlap between MDS and MPN, and sometimes it's very difficult to give an exact diagnosis. And it's just called an, an overlap. 
Um, sometimes it was clear that somebody had one of the diseases and then progressed to the other into an overlap. But we see fibrosis commonly in people with that overlap. They, they can have, can be, have higher counts in the white count sometimes in the platelets. They sometimes can have a bigger spleen too. Um, so it is genomic abnormalities that are common to both. Yeah, so there's a lot of overlap between um, between the genetic mutations in MDS and MPN, and it has to do with the frequency. Sometimes, the, if you look at a hundred people, one disease or the other, they both have those mutations, but they will be more common in MPNs than MDS. And then in the overlap, they tend to share mutations that are, if it's MDS, that are more MPN common. Yeah, so. There are some that are more common. Uh -huh. What are the symptoms of the skin? So it's usually you can see it. Um, you can see red areas on the skin that look like little nodules that you can palpate sometimes. Nothing, you know, it, that, that's usually the, the major uh, thing that you see. Sometimes, but oftentimes just the sort of discoloration. You may notice it and some of you didn't notice it. It's hard to tell sometimes the difference between that and bruising. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's usually something you can palpate where bruised wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't feel it. <coughs> Drug trials, <coughs> say, are ongoing. Yeah. Must you have that 5Q mutation to qualify for them? Uh, for which, which one? Uh, I, I can't remember what. So the so the lenalidomide, the Revlimid, right. is very. That's just standard, and you can um, get that outside of the trial. Okay. And the other the other trials were really most uh, the mutations. Um, most of them you require the mutation. Okay. There are trials in the early stages for some of these genes where it's open to everybody, and then they narrow it down to people just with that mutation. But it's the genetics are very informative, and I think more and more are helping us dictate and drive what treatments would be best. And if we don't have a standard treatment, which trial would be the most appropriate? How close are you in treating MDS with immunotherapy? There, so it's been tried um, with some of the drugs in, in other cancers that are successful. Mm -hmm. it had, the, the standard drugs haven't been. Um, dramatic at this point. And so there, there are currently different ways that people are trying to combine those. It's not that it's not going to move forward. And I think the other interesting thing is cells. You trying to use cell therapy. So most of these drugs have been trying to change the response of the cells that are there to the MDS. But now we're starting to use cells that we manipulate and infuse into patients. So it's been really successful in people with lymphomas and lymphoid leukemias, yeah. and now we're trying it in people with AML and MDS. It's further behind, it's harder, but I think that there's going to be some success there. All right, well, thank you. Um, and we can chat more uh, in between sessions. Thank you.